morning, everyone, and welcome uh, back to Plans Virtual Town Hall. We are excited to be with you. And first, thank you to all our essential heroes out there uh, who continue to do an amazing job and, and keep us proud. Uh, have a lot uh, to kind of cover with you today, a few announcements, and then, of course, our featured uh, presenter. Remember, this is all driven by you, our participants. So uh, please uh, remember your questions for our illustrious panel, who I'll get into shortly here. Uh, we would love to be able to be here for you today to answer all of your questions by hitting the Q&A button below to get us going. So Nick, if you could move us over and let's talk about some great announcements we have. So mark your calendars for sure. We have US, oh, Nick, you're just messing with me. There we go. We have US Congressman Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey's fifth district who will be presenting the effects of COVID on New Jersey. That's on Thursday, June 11th at 11 a.m. So that is not our Tuesday time slot. That will be a Thursday. If you are registered as a participant here, you'll automatically be registered uh, to hear the congressman. So we're very excited to be having uh, Josh Gottheimer uh, on the 11th at 11 a.m. Also, in the time slot here in two weeks, we will be hosting a virtual trade show. A lot of you have wanted to get to know the vendors that you've seen here week in and week out. We're presenting a virtual trade show so that you will be able to actually meet, talk about their services, what they do. We'll have separate Zoom rooms. Of course, we'll have just like an, a regular trade show, we'll have some training for you to be able to attend uh, to get some credits. So we're very excited. We think we're the first to be able to do this or bring it to you. So mark your calendars for Tuesday, two weeks from today, June 16th at 10 a.m. in our regular time slot. You won't want to miss that. Uh, that's going to be exciting. So mark your calendars. Remember who our panel, so you can ask questions of all of our best and the best in their industries today. Uh, of course, we have Nick and JJ uh, from Planned. We have Jeff from Heartline, Ben from American Pools, Martin from Becker and Palahoff. Ross is here from JGS today. It's the first time we have Ross on the panel. Welcome in, Ross. Ray is here from City Fire. Bill's here from Serta Pro Painters. We have Lisa from Cooper Pest Control. Of course, Steve from Falcon. And our feature presenter will be on today to answer any of your questions. And let's welcome him in now, Ellis Dumont from Advanced Parking Concepts. Ellis, all yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dino, for the kind introduction. And before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge planned companies and all the presenters for stepping up and sharing their best practices. As it has been said, we are all in this together. The COVID-19 pandemic has robbed us of too much already, taking lives and livelihoods with indiscriminate abandon, altering our daily lives in ways we could barely have imagined back when spring was dawning in early March. It has had a profound effect, not only on the parking industry, but in every business and social interaction. My topic this morning is best practices, safe parking service in a COVID-19 environment. Uh, Nick, next slide. My name is Ellis Dumont, and I am the founder and CEO of Advanced Parking Concepts, which is better known by the acronym APC. Headquartered in Verona, New Jersey, APC is the largest hospitality provider in the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut region, and has been proudly creating the perfect first and last impression for 35 years. APC is primarily known as a valet operator with additional verticals in parking management, shuttle service, front circle administration, directed assisted parking, and parking design consulting. APC's portfolio is a unique niche of residential, healthcare, commercial, and event type locations. Next slide. I thought I would start this presentation out by discussing how COVID-19 has impacted the parking industry. 
Quite simply, the effect of mandatory shutdowns has crippled the parking industry. The majority of operators have been on average 90 to 95% reduction in transactions and have had to furlough or have laid off a majority of their staff. Parking is dependent on corporate hospitality and events. The fact that most of that is suspended or extremely limited has had a devastating effect. APC, due to our unique portfolios, is still operating at our residential and medical locations. Our event and commercial portfolio has essentially been shut down by local and state governments, and I would estimate that we're, we're operating at about 60% capacity. We are one of the only, if not the only, parking company in the country not to have laid off or furloughed any of our personnel. I am pleased that our safety protocols and best practices have contained this virus to affecting only a few of our many personnel. On a positive note, studies have shown that people are going to be less likely to utilize Uber, Lyft, and mass transit moving forward. The effect of this will mean more people will utilize their vehicles, and this will have an obvious positive impact on the return of the parking industry, and perhaps be a barometer to the economy returning. I believe every parking operator has an inherent responsibility to provide safe pathways of operation. Next slide. Our multifaceted approach to ensure the health of clientele and employees. In early March, it was very apparent that COVID-19 was a serious and life-threatening issue. Our executive team immediately instituted CDC mandated safety guidelines such as enforcing that our staff extensively change their gloves and wash their hands after every interaction. We enforce the six foot rule of social distancing, which is and has been particularly challenging in a valet patron interaction. And we provided PPE equipment to all of our personnel consisting of vinyl gloves and face masks. Immediate meetings and training sessions were held with all location managers and their respective staffs. Topics included, but were not limited, to extensive training on the proper use of gloves, hand sanitizers, UVA equipment, and wipes on the many touch points that valet, front circle greeters, and shuttle workers deal with. Simultaneously, and of utmost importance, we conducted and established a robust communication with property managers, boards of directors, and facility managers so that we could collaborate our efforts to maintain and promote safety. Next slide. As you can see from this slide, there are various touch points that we're focused on. Key fobs, steering wheels, door handles, consoles, push start buttons, front desk stations, keyboards, and work areas that include writing utensils and um, our uh, technology devices. Uh, our approach has been somewhat unique as we are not only using sanitizing wipes, but have deployed UVA bags to further sanitize keys, along with our smart technology devices. And additionally, we are starting to deploy portable UVA wands as a supplement to cleaning these touch points. In the event that a driver would rather clean their own interior touch points, APC is rolling out complimentary sanitizer packets. Next slide. APC's national and local approaches. I believe that it is fair to say that any organization who provides some form of service has an obligation to provide and execute to their patrons a comfort level of safe procedures and communicate on the specific best practices they are deploying. As a part of that, APC is on a blue ribbon committee of all the major parking operators in the country, creating a safe park initiative that is sponsored by the National Parking Association. Essentially, the goal is to provide a roadmap for the safe execution of best practices to every parking environment and venue. Additionally, APC is part of a task force of New York City event planners and locations on setting up parameters to be presented to Governor Cuomo for reopening protocols. And lastly, on a local level, APC has deployed a combination of digital platforms, daily safety location conference calls, and real-time camera monitoring from our office command center to ensure daily compliance of our safety initiatives. Next slide. 
new protocols. I'm sure I speak for everyone that we're tired of, of talking towards the new norm. However, that is the reality that we're faced with. So for APC and the parking industry, that means face coverings are now part of the uniform. Social distancing, particularly in the interaction between valet and passengers, must be maintained while still performing exceptional service. Deploying technologies like UVA equipment while advising that it may take a bit longer to retrieve your vehicle and installing plastic barriers on podiums and work areas to properly shield both patron and employee and moving completely to APC's ticketless technology. These are but a few action points that will continue to evolve and become part of what will encompass a company's best practices in creating a safe environment. Next slide. Commitment to community. Perhaps one of the action items I'm most proud of. When this crisis first surfaced, I challenged our executive staff to try to find a mechanism to help our residential portfolio with the dual goal of maintaining our employees working. In short order, our executive staff developed the APC COVID-19 Grocery Food Delivery Assistance Program for service at our residential communities. We contacted local grocery stores, established their online ordering mechanisms, used our sale team to create and provide a help desk in order to coordinate pickups and deliveries, and utilized our shuttle division as a vehicle to actually provide those pickups and deliveries, all as a free service. The result has exceeded our expectations and has been a huge success. The program helps keep residents, particularly the most vulnerable, self-quarantined and safe, while simultaneously providing work opportunities for our staff. It is an example of company doctrine that we define as the APC way, a deep commitment to community. In the spirit of the greater good, both nationally and locally, APC will continue to lead the way and share our company's best practices. Next slide. So in conclusion, by nature, I'm an optimist. I sincerely feel that if every commercial operator establishes and executes best practices, there is an opportunity to come out of this even stronger with our core constituencies. In fact, I think those of us who lead will absolutely develop new relationships as well. I'm sincerely appreciative to Plant for their leadership in showcasing this wonderful forum and allowing me the opportunity to present this topic today. Um, I thank you for all your time. I tried to be brief and your attention, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellis. Fantastic job and, and welcome APC to our illustrious panel. Uh, we look forward to uh, some Q&A with you today, and, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty. And of course, we'll have Ellis on our panel every week for you as we continue to bring you the best of the best. And clearly, APC is the best at what they do. So welcome to the panel, Ellis and APC. Some quick uh, reminders here. We are driven by Q&A down below. So if you have questions for Ellis or any of our other panelists, I'll show you them again in a minute, but just some quick uh, things to remind you of. If you want to watch this after, uh, or if you want to show anyone else these, these uh, weekly town halls, we store them on our website, plancompanies.com on our COVID-19. They're there for you uh, to watch anytime you like. Uh, next week, we're excited to be having Wilkin and Gutten Plan join us uh, next Tuesday. So I'm sure there's plenty of financial questions uh, all with all that's happening right now. Uh, we're excited to be having Wilkin and Gutten Plan join us next week as we continue to bring you the best of the best. Nick, if we could go to the announcement, because I think we've had some people join us, and I'm sorry to do this. I know I'm a pain. Uh, we had some people join us since we made our announcements. We are a uh, couple things to note. We have U.S. Congressman Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey's 5th District, who will be with us on Thursday, the 11th. So not on one of our regular Tuesdays. 
and he, and we are lucky to have him. We're excited to have him. The effects of COVID-19 on New Jersey. Uh, anyone who is registered for our town halls is automatically registered for that event and you'll get an invite to join us. Our virtual trade show. Very excited to talk about this Tuesday, June 16th. That will take the place of our regular town hall. Many of you have asked, love your panelists, love to know more about them, love to know what they do, how they can help, how we can engage with them. So we are going to have our panelists in a virtual trade show where you'll be able to not only learn more about their companies, their organizations and what they do, but you'll be able to engage with them one-on-one -on -one, just like you would at a regular trade show to be able to talk business with them. So as we continue these uh, COVID specific trade shows every week here, we think this is a good opportunity for you to now attend a trade show and, and meet these amazing people. Speaking of these amazing people, Nick, I know, I know. Can you bring me to the amazing people slide real quick? There they are, our panel. So you can ask questions of any of these amazing folks. And um, before we get into it, almost forgot again. Speaking of these amazing people, I always ask before we get into Q&A, if you have any quick updates from last week, since we met last week to today that you would like to share with our audience. Hey, Dino, Martin here from Becker. A um, couple of quick updates. I'm sure many people have already started to hear this, but um, in New Jersey, Governor Murphy, um, as of June 15th, will be moving into stage two um, of his reopening uh, plan. And if you look at his original announcement a couple of weeks ago about what those stages mean, they're not um, specific, but generally what it says is there's going to be relaxed additional activities, um, but these are activities that can be you know, easily safeguarded um, in, in, in his words. Um, he did say um, some specifics, though, yesterday um, at his conference. Um, that, that's going to be things like outdoor dining at restaurants can start on 615, um, and non-essential in-person retail can open back up on 615. So it's nice to hear that we're moving in a positive direction, and we're going to start getting some um, businesses back. Um, 622 salons and barbershops can reopen. Um, and then he, he didn't give a specific date, but he said in the period to follow, it would still be under the stage two, would be gyms and health clubs. And, and I'm curious as to whether that's going to include pools or not. But I think we are um, hopefully going to start to see those items come back online, um, pools included soon. Um, obviously, all of this is going to require um, adherence to whatever guidelines the state puts in place, most likely CDC guidelines. Um, so just keep that in mind. But um, definitely a positive direction. Um, for for all involved and for you know everyone who's been you know stuck at home for these past few weeks to see that um, some things are going to start coming back online and hopefully some of our facilities will be um, opened up again very soon. Thank you, Martin. Appreciate that. Anyone else for a quick update? Yeah, just uh, Ben with American Fool. Quick update on some uh, some of the markets that we operate in. Uh, big uh, news was Maryland opening up their swimming facilities, uh, or at least making it permissible to open. And um, also uh, Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, as of June 5th, uh, pools will be open there. In both cases, though, of course, there's additional requirements. So it's not a matter of, hey, you hit the date, open up. Um, you know, there, there, there are the new requirements that uh, you know, have to be considered. So that's what we're uh, working on now that those are that's a big group of pools getting open now. Thanks, Ben. I don't know if it was just my uh, audio, but it sounded like a little unclear. Uh, but I think everyone uh, was able to hear you. Was there anybody else with any uh, quick updates before we turn it over to Nick for Q&A? Great. Thank you, everyone. Nick? Okay, Dino, great. We've got uh, we, our first question from the audience for Ellis, a uh, comment and a question. Uh, Ellis, uh, thanks so much for a great presentation. Can you describe a little bit more about the ticket list technology options? Sure, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think one of the considerations the parking industry is looking at is how do you limit 
the interaction uh, between patron and valet. Um, and that not only goes from a, a valet operation, but it also goes for a garage operation. And prior to all of this, we were starting to deploy um, a ticketless situation, um, a ticketless solution um, that we had developed um, that really is a non-app uh, uh, um, platform that via just simply our valet getting a text um, number from the patron allows them to um, enter all the pertinent information about the vehicle and the owner. And in order for the owner to get the vehicle back, they are able to text us immediately and get it. And it also allows, which is the part I like most, um, a interchange uh, so that if uh, two way interchange, so that if there are anything that uh, would cause a delay, we're able to uh, let the customer know that um, as well as uh, if the customer had any special needs uh, and especially nowadays there are many needs especially when we're working at our medical centers uh, we have to be very cognizant of of the uh, specific client we're dealing with um, so we find that and now there are many many other systems out there most do uh, require an app um, but we feel that is going to be the trend moving forward that all parking operations are going to go ticketless Okay, a great answer. Uh, Ellis, uh, another follow-up question here. Uh, what percentage of parking activities do you see coming back in 2020? Well, that's a great question. And of course, it's very hard to say. I think like every business, the parking industry is confined to government oversight. Um, that said, as mentioned during the presentation, you cannot underestimate the importance of people driving their own vehicles and not utilizing mass transit, Uber, and Lyft. Um, we believe that will help parking operators, uh, particularly in urban areas. Um, the flip side of that is, of course, the amount of people who may stay at home and work and not drive at all. Um, the other consideration, um, and you know, there there's a dichotomy with the valet and garage. You know that you know they're two separate entities, and they're really not. Anybody that goes into a New York City um, parking garage or lot knows that they're not going to be able to self-park. They're going to turn their vehicle over to a valet. And so, you, you know, it, it's up to both entities to come up with solutions. And, and I believe that's where we have to get out in front of it and illustrate all of our company's best practices and almost have a uniform code across the board to give people confidence in using parking again. Um, the, the thought that it can all be self-parking is just not, it may work in some suburban areas, but it won't work in most urban areas and dense populations. So it's very difficult to say. Again, I'm an optimist, so I, I hope that it comes back sooner than later. Um, a lot of people, just like every industry, are suffering. So we're hopeful that we can help speed that along in, in giving people confidence in using parking. Hey, thank you, Ellis. Uh, that's a great answer. Uh, question for Ray uh, with City Fire. Should we check with the local authority having jurisdiction, and it says uh, AHJ, to find out if they require any special provisions prior to reoccupying a building? <clears throat> yes, yeah, as I had mentioned last week, <clears throat> each case is going to be a case by case basis. So you're going to want to talk to your fire inspector, have him come in, look at your building. Um, he's probably going to want to check your emergency uh, action plan, which you should probably have. You might have probably updated uh, due to the virus. You want to have different ways of egress and different things might have changed. So my advice is to always give them a call. Uh, right now, some of them are working or not working, depending on the town. Some of them will be able to come out there. Uh, they're probably looking for something to do. Uh, after sitting around for a long time. So they would be happy to come out and check out your building. And this way you're proactive. And if they have any suggestions or any safety features that they want implemented, you'll be, uh, you'll be ahead of the game and doing it proactively instead of uh, waiting or making some mistake when you open the building. So I would say, yes, give them a call, make an appointment, have them come out and look at your building. Okay, Ray, thank you. Uh, we've got a, a question for Ben with American Pools. Uh, once a state decides to open swimming pools for use, can we open the community pool right away? 
Uh, hopefully my, my audio is coming in a little better. Do I sound okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you should not just immediately open the pool. Uh, there, along with the uh, permission to open, is going to come uh, additional requirements. So you want to make sure that you understand those requirements and have a plan to address them. So a lot of the things will be in, in along the lines of uh, prevention. So that's signage and education for the residents. You'll see, uh, you know, provisions about social distance. And uh, usually that will come across as uh, getting a maximum, a new maximum capacity for the facility. You have to have a plan to address that so that the pool does not get overcrowded. And then a sanitation plan to expand uh, your janitorial, the frequency of that, uh, of that is going to need to go up significantly as you've seen in other parts of the community. So that all needs to be uh, planned for, documented, and so on in advance of getting open. So I would manage expectations and, and uh, expect, you know, anywhere from two to four weeks uh, to transition to actually getting the gates open. Okay, great. Thank you, Ben. We've got a question for Jeff uh, with Heartline. Why should we use a fitness professional to specifically handle fitness equipment disinfection? Great question. Um, and three simple answers. Um, there's a, a three-step phase and process that we're doing uh, during COVID right now. Uh, one is the typical PM that we've been doing to take things apart, get all the, the dust, the dirt, the virus, things out from inside the equipment. Um, two is the, the disinfectant needs to be handled with um, the proper chemical solutions. Uh, the wrong chemicals can delaminate buttons and short out consoles, things like that. So you need to use the right solution, the equipment sensitive. And third um, is the protectant that we're applying to the touch surfaces to really um, diminish and, and help reduce the transfer um, after the disinfectant on any of these touch surfaces. And the fitness center is a, a unique environment. Um, we're breathing heavier. We have an elevated heart rate, elevated respiratory rate. So there's definitely some you know, precautions outside of the normal spaces that we're disinfecting more that you really need to have somebody in there that knows what they're doing, how to treat these products and, and what to treat them with. So great, great question. Okay, outstanding. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, question for Ellis. What grocery stores have you partnered up with and what is the cost to use your service? How, how do you set this up? Well, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, we really go by uh, the location of our residential community and find the closest um, grocery store um, that's of willing to work with us. Um, some of them have their own Instacart uh, type systems. Uh, in some cases, we're working together with them as well. Um, so it really goes by wherever the geographic location of our residential property is. We research uh, somewhere uh, in that vicinity. Um, so really, in answer to what uh, grocery stores, just about every major brand we're dealing with. Um, what we did do, um, one of our colleagues had a relationship with um, a store uh, uh, in um, Wayne and they were able to sort of prioritize our, our customers. And the fact that we were using our shuttle division meant that we could just go really anywhere and deliver, you know, cause again, from a supply line, uh, there were some issues initially. So we tried to have our help desk really intervene at times to get people their groceries quicker than might ha they might have been. Um, and as far as what the cost is, this is a free service for our residential clientele. Um, we have not opened it up uh, to the public. Um, it is something we are considering down the road. It might be another future vertical. Um, but at this point, it's a free service for our clientele. Mm. Wow. Okay, thank you, Ellis. Uh, question Steve, for uh, Steve Lang of Falcon. My community is on the fence about starting a construction project. Why should we consider starting a project now rather than putting it off for a year. Oh, Steve, wow. Audio, it's audio. Got some audio problems. Sorry. Um, wow, 
can you maybe hit mute and unmute again? No. No. Wow. Sorry. Sorry, like Steve. Fast-forward version of Mickey Mouse. That is, yeah, that is Mickey Mouse. Boy, Mickey Mouse with a couple of cups of coffee. All right. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Uh, Nick with Plant, uh, the other Nick, the uh, better looking Nick. Uh, what, um, what do you do to get remote workers up and running? Oh, well, that's a, that's a good question. It's actually a very common question nowadays. Um, there are a lot of ways to do this and there's not one size fits all for this, but really look at it from a perspective of you have your data and you have your voice. What do you need? How do you get it there? So a lot of voice, you can, uh, a lot of phone systems you can forward to cell phones, uh, you can take desk phones home now. There's smartphone apps that you can tie back into your phone systems. These are things that you can go back and talk to your provider about and say, hey, I need this for X amount of time, or this is going to be a more of a permanent thing. They may come up with a better solution for that. Um, now, as far as your data, you can go about it as a uh, simple tool like go to meeting or uh, go to my PC, team viewer, just to get access to the machines that are in your network. If you want something a little bit more robust, you have to talk to your uh, IT department, talk to your provider about getting a VPN, something that'll connect your machines right back to your network, and you'll have full access to all your data all the time. Those are the key elements that we use. Um, anything above that starts to become more like application delivery, a little bit more advanced, more engineering involved. Um, at that point, you're looking at managed service providers. So those are the, those are the key pieces behind that. You know? Okay, Nick. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question for uh, Ross Rutman, JGS Insurance. Uh, Ross, uh, we're seeing the nationwide protests leading to riots, theft, vandalism, fires. Is there coverage if this happens within our association? Good morning. Thank you for the question. Uh, finally, something here we can confidently say there is insurance coverage for. There's a lot going on in the world right now. It's a little crazy, but from our community perspective, as well as our businesses, there's always coverage for vandalism and fire, so long as we are not the ones that own the property and burnt it down intentionally. Uh, so yes, there is coverage here. God forbid this does take place on our side of the fence. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Question for Dino. Uh, does anyone have a suggestion on where to look for someone to hire for a community pool in terms of COVID requirements and sanitation, including monitoring the number of people allowed at a time? Uh, absolutely, and I'm going to ask for uh, perhaps Ben and Martin uh, to help me uh, after I answer my piece, because of course, Planned can provide the staff required to do everything asked in that question. We have the ability to do so. Um, ben, I'd like your perspective because I, I think, and Martin, from, from what I understand and what I'm hearing legally, this is not something uh, that, that pool monitors should be handling this from what i understand through the question you want to uh know who's coming into the area who's leaving the area tracking that different than what a lifeguard's functions might be in fact from a legal perspective i've, I've been hearing that it's not a good idea to have lifeguards doing this function yeah i mean go and ben if you want to start go ahead yeah okay so uh that the answer to that is going to be highly dependent on on the the where that community is located and um, you know what the uh, what the the normal staffing of the pool looks like. So there are some facilities that are larger scale. We already do gate control. We already have a, a uh, someone that's that's uh, there at the gate. We're staffed in those cases. To, um, to check people in and, and use whatever form of check-in that there is uh, through the community. But that's, that's a specific position to accomplish that task. Most of the facilities we run are uh, single guard facilities and, uh, or even if they're two guard facilities, you really need both of those guards. You need their capacity to guard the pool. And what Dino's talking about there is you absolutely do not want the staff that's supposed to be guarding the pool taking on these these other responsibilities. And um, I, I think that in many cases, a company like Planned is really well positioned uh, to provide uh, a more of a more of a, a security type 
uh, experience where, where people are coming in and checking in and there's, there's significant tracking of, uh, and, and recording of who's coming in and who's leaving. Um, you know, that's something that, you know, planned is, is, is very versed in, in terms of, you know, managing, uh, managing the building. So, um, long story short, don't have the lifeguards handle the front gate. The, they have enough to handle with the pool area. It's not their primary responsibility. You have to plan on adding staff. Uh, we have our hands full just doing the guard team typically. So expanding, uh, you know, janitorial pass checking to, you know, unarmed security or, or other uh, resources that you have makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that, Ben. And obviously, we don't know for certain whether that's going to be required. I think we all are pretty safely assuming that it is something like that might be required based on what we're seeing in other states, based on what in New Jersey, Governor Murphy has done thus far with facilities that he has allowed to reopen. So I think you're going to look at that. The one additional thing I would add to that is don't have association members perform those services either. Um, I get it. You might be have you might have someone in your community who wants to volunteer to provide that service to help keep the cost down. But then the association at that point or the property at that point is taking on obviously some additional liability and responsibility to train that person um, in uh, adherence to CDC requirements and sanitation requirements. And um, it's just not a good idea ultimately um, to do so, particularly because that's not going to be covered as uh, Ross and, and the folks from the insurance companies know all too well, probably not going to be covered by your insurance. Um, so yeah, this is definitely something you want to have somebody like a plan companies. Um, I think um, Dino had mentioned you guys would offer these types of services. So that'd be great. That's who you want to start talking to. Thank you both. Appreciate the color to, uh, to my answer. Nick. Hey, thank you, gentlemen. A uh, question for Jeff of Heartline. What are the costs in the HVAC savings associated with the Atmos air system? Great question. Um, so just for those who are not familiar with what Atmos air is, um, this is, we, all of us are talking a lot about protecting the surfaces and disinfecting. This is a, a, a wonderful technology, bipolar ionization of the air. Uh, so we're seeking and destroying, attacking the air uh, on the supply side rather than the return side with the filter. Um, and specifically in the fitness center or any amenity space, we can apply this. Uh, the savings, you know, there's there's two kind of categories, right? You've got a CapEx savings um, scenario and you also have an OpEx uh, savings scenario. So, you know, 15% reduction uh, in equipment on the CapEx side of it, um, whereas you're, you're cleaning the air. So you're, you know, there's, it's easier to circulate. It's easier to clean cleaner air. Um, and then the OPEX side, really, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent uh, energy savings uh, with kind of processing this air and keeping it cleaner. The systems work better, right, if they don't have dirty air. So, you know, there, there's a substantial savings here. But again, I think that the main point is uh, here's a great technology to attack the air, which is a, a very difficult thing to do inside spaces. Uh, and with the bipolar ionization, it's we've we've got a ton of customers uh, jumping on to providing this type of technology in that fitness space because we've got this elevated uh, respiratory rate and contamination factor. So great question, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. All right, we've got a uh, question for Ray with City Fire. Uh, I've seen there are cameras that can take the temperature of any person walking through the door. Do you know anything about them? How they work? Also, legally, is it a good idea to screen employees, residents, or visitors? Yeah, so I think I had also mentioned on this one time that we're doing that for our employees. We have a camera that uh, has a laser that um, as soon as they step in a certain spot, it takes their temperature and tells us if they're, uh, if they're healthy, if they're okay to come to work. We use that internally. So that's for us just to, you know, make sure that we're, give, we're sending our employees out to our customers and that they're happy and that they're not... Uh, you know, they don't have a temperature. Uh, just the first part of screening, obviously, if they're sick or any other symptoms, uh, this is just the first part of it. So we do actually uh, have these cameras. We do um, sell these cameras. They're a little bit expensive, but it could be for someone's application. It could, it could work for them if they're screening their employees like we are, or possibly if they want to screen their residents or their visitors. I would uh, defer to Martin to ask about um, 
the legal part of it, maybe do you want to do this or do you not want to do this? I think could be the question. There could be a reason why you'd want to purchase one or not want to purchase one. I think maybe Morton can help us with that as far as if it's a good idea for liability's sake. Um, it's probably a good idea. Does that mean it's a necessity? No, I don't think any government order is going to say that you have to do it. Um, this goes back to what we've been talking about the past few weeks about layering um, defenses, right, for an association and, and upping your um, protection in light of the fact that you might not have insurance coverage for certain things. Um, the same would apply to contractors who wanted to implement these things. Each thing you do um, creates a better defense that you were taking all reasonable precautions and all reasonable actions. So um, is it something that's going to be required or uh, no, probably not. But is it something that's going to be on a recommended list that we might put out? Yeah, absolutely. Good. So if it's something that's recommended, we can actually provide those cameras. And like I said, they, they do work. And it is just, like you said, another line of defense and possibly just a, uh, you know, mm -hmm. protection that we can take yeah. if it's uh, – it's a good idea, Absolutely. you know, we know we have that resource for us. We can help people. Absolutely, that, that, that's a great resource. Thank you, Ray. Okay, thank you. Uh, question for Juan Jose Chavez of Plan Companies. Uh, janitorial question, do we need to increase the amount of people that clean my building? Good morning, and that, that's, that's a good question. So the short answer is not necessarily, however, there are a couple of things to consider because every building is different. Every association is different. So the first step that I would recommend is to really understand what your current team is doing, the frequency and the areas that your current team is doing. And based on that, um, agree with your janitorial provider of what is going to look like after all the amenities are open or if, if they're already open what are, what are the effects of uh, cleaning those areas and how long it takes? Uh, for example, you know, CDC recommends increasing the disinfecting in, in frequently touched areas. So perhaps you will need one person to extend the hours of service, but it should be tailored. It shouldn't be taken as a blanket approach. And that's where adding the value with your janitorial provider and working together to really tailor something to your building comes into place. Um, so I hope, I hope that that answers the question. Uh, I did, JJ. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a question for Martin and probably Ben. Um, as it relates to opening an outdoor pool, specifically allowing only lap exercise swimming in the beginning phase one in Virginia, what other effective communication methods in addition to signage and orientation for uh, residents would you recommend? What strategies can we use to make our active 55 plus residents understand that operations will be different? So, sorry, I'm trying to unmute there. Uh, I think at a minimum, you're going to want to look to the CDC guidelines about reopening pools, um, center disease control guidelines. Um, start there uh, and obviously implement all of those recommendations. Um, the second place to go is your um, state executive orders. Um, see what recommendations they have about pools. And then uh, a third place to go would be local municipal orders, county and um, township orders that may apply to um, your area. Um, and you'll find a, a, probably a litany of recommendations at those sources. So at a minimum, all of those things. In addition to that, um, yes, signage will be an important thing. Uh, you can consider getting um, waivers from those who are using the pool, though understand that um, from state to state, waiver laws are going to vary. Um, it may or may not hold up. It's not, um, you know, an outright protection. Um, in New Jersey, you can look to see if your community has tort immunity. I don't know if Virginia has a statute like New Jersey does that allows um, community associations to adopt tort immunity, meaning residents can't sue the association, or not residents, deeded owners and their spouses can't sue the association for personal injury. Um, New Jersey has something like that, and a lot of the communities already have that as part of their governing documents, but if you don't, maybe amend the governing documents to include that. I'm not aware offhand if Virginia, though, has something like that, so certainly um, check with your, your local council um, on that, but those are some of the things you could do um, in addition, obviously, to the cleaning and having a monitor there to make sure that the CDC the social distancing recommendation and sanitation is all being um, followed. 
Okay, so just as a, a follow up on that, um, and, and I, I know part of the question was about, you know, what are the different ways that we can uh, communicate to the residents, uh, you know, that things are not going to be, that it's not going to be business as usual at the pool. And I know in Virginia, uh, they do allow now open for lap swimming and it's a very low maximum capacity and it is very different than a, a normal day at the pool. Um, so it's, uh, pe people, if, if you want to make sure that they understand fully, uh, how different or educate them further, I think you brought up a couple of really good ones, obviously the signage and, uh, some kind of orientation, but if you have a website, a community website, that might be a great place to put up your, uh, new pool rules, make sure that they're all there. Obviously those want to, you want those distributed as well. So distribute and then house it, uh, the new pool rules. I also find that an FAQ uh, is hugely important because people read the rules and they're, you know, then they have questions. Well, what if this and what if that? And there's only probably, you know, so many questions that, that you're going to get and they're going to start to repeat. So as those questions come in, you want to develop that FAQ uh, so that um, they can kind of self-service their, their question and um, you know, take some pressure off the community manager and the board in that way. Um, Great. Thank so you, those, those, are, those are some examples there. Yeah, and just real quick, I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Uh, mass communication emails, sending everything out in bulk. I like the idea of using the website. Uh, there are phone service providers where you can blast out one recorded message to your entire property. So there's plenty of alternatives out there to get the word out. Constant communication is going to be key here. Thank you, guys. Great answers. Thank you, panelists. Uh, for another great event. We've gotten through all of our Q&A today. So excited about that. Nick, you might want to put up one more time for me our upcoming events, uh, which I'm very excited about. Thank you. Uh, definitely mark your calendars for these events. You don't want to miss them.